Hi everyone, welcome. It's lovely to see you here in person and welcome to our online community as well. I'm Karen, um, one of the pastors here at LBC for a couple of more weeks. <laughs> So it's good to be preaching today. I've actually, it's about a month since I've preached here because the uh, last time was at Christmas time and then we've had uh, other things happening. So it's lovely to be preaching uh, today and next week. Although I have to say it's rather poignant, at least for me, because these will be the last two sermons that I preach in this place as a pastor in this place. I'm open to be invited back if you ever <laughs> fancy that. <laughs> but as your pastor, my last two sermons. And so Josh and I, of course, and other staff have been talking about what to do in this space and indeed what to do in the space immediately following my departure. And we landed on the idea that for this next two weeks, so today and next week, I would spend some time looking at how we can uh, go with confidence into the transition uh, that we're already in because of COVID and other things, but the transition that we'll be going into in the next week or two as well. And Josh is then going to pick up the baton on the 14th of February and give you a couple of weeks, take a couple of weeks to uh, spend some time for you to think about who you are as a church before introducing the series that will let, take you right through to Easter. <laughs> Can you believe we're already talking about Easter? So today and next week, we're going to be thinking about how we can be sure of what we are sure of as we step into a major transition period for a number of reasons. And we're going to look at how being sure of what we are sure of can actually help us with the things we're not at all sure of, can help us with the unknown. I heard an American a preacher, he was preaching around New Year's Eve, just uh, 2020, uh, his name is Jeff Henderson. I heard him talking about the way that human beings approach uh, New Year's resolutions, but I, I think you could also say uh, new seasons and transitions in general. Uh, he, he said it's, it's, he, that at these sort of times, at New Year's resolution time, and I think it's fair to say at transition or new seasons time, people fall into one of two categories. It's a huge generalisation. Some of us are dreamers, and others are realists. And I take a bet that in that moment that I said that you, I, people are telling each other, yeah, you already picked which one you think you are and you have some opinion about who the person next to you might be. And you might also have an opinion about whether or not what you are and the person next to you is better or worse than if they're different to you, you know? I imagine I can see that happening. Dreamer or realist? <laughs> This is a terrible generalisation, but it's the quickest way I can think to actually get this point across. The, the, the easiest way to classify the difference between a dreamer and the realist is that a dreamer is all about the wow. Wow, it's a new year, it's a new chapter. Think of the things we might be able to do. Look at what might be possible. Whereas the realist will ask, hmm, how? How are you going to make that wow happen? <laughs> Tell me how. Dreamer or realist, neither are inherently right or wrong. They're just different, although we often have our opinions, don't we? So I want to say, even as we start today, and we should be saying this to those who are dreamers amongst us, it's okay to dream. In fact, please, please dream. We need you to dream. Just make sure that your dreams don't become illusions, fantasy, mirage. Do dream and then make your plans. Maybe get some help from the how people to make your plans towards those dreams. Turn your dreams into something possible. And to the realists among us, we need to say, uh, it's okay to push back and ask how. In fact, please do. Please do push back and ask how. But here's the trick for you guys. Don't let your realism slide into pessimism, negativity, doom and gloom, or it'll never happen. How could we possibly make that happen? Do ask your how questions, you realists, and be open to possibilities. You see, possibility is where it all hangs, really, I think. It's probably fair to say that most of the extraordinary things that have happened in human history, the most amazing breakthroughs and outstanding developments that you know, generations before people could never have even imagined, they've happened because human beings have been prepared to look through the lens of possibility. They, but they've both dreamt dream, dreams and been able to ask the how questions. And I think that's really what uh, looking at life through the lens of possibility is about. It's about combining the dreaming and the realism in just the right measures in order to get something done. 
So I want to give you just one example. You know, you and I can take trips in airplanes. Well, we used to be able to take trips in airplanes easily. Not just because we're wealthy. That's one of the reasons we can take trips in airplanes. But because two brothers who ran a bicycle shop and enjoyed bird watching in their downtime because of them. Because of Wilbur and Orville Wright, who had no higher education, no technical training, no financial backers or friends in high places. But they saw life through the lens of possibility. They watched birds flying and they dreamed of flying. But more than that, they watched birds flying and they asked, how do, how do they do that? How might it be possible to do something so that human beings can fly as well? So I think you can see in that little example that looking at life through the lens of possibility combines the best of dreaming and the best of being a realist. Now, Jeff Henderson, that, that pastor that I heard speaking uh, about this, had what I thought was quite a nifty way of describing how this works. He says, people like the Wright brothers lived in the land of possibility and they leased property in the land of reality. They lived with all their being. They owned property in the land of possibility, but they did lease in the land of reality and visit that place from time to time. Hang on to that thought. I hope you might see how it makes some sense. <laughs> it struck me, you see, when I heard him say that, that there might be something for us in this as we step into a new chapter. What would it be like in this next season if we bought property, lived in the land of possibility, which surely as people who follow Jesus is the place we need to live because he's a radical God who sees extraordinary possibility in all of creation. So what if we bought land, bought property, lived in the land of possibility and leased land in reality where we do need to go from time to time just to check in? How's things going? <laughs> How is what we are dreaming of over here actually going to work out and be a reality? What would life look like for you as a church, for us, through the lens of possibility? And what I want to try and do is answer that question by first of all going backwards or back in time, a couple of thousand years to a church at Galatia. So what, what can this, this experience of the church in, in Galatia teach us? Now, the letter uh, that was written to the Galatians was written by Paul, like so many letters in the Old Testament. And he wrote it after he had first established the church. So the church had been established, and then he'd gone away, and then he'd heard about some goings-on, so he, he wrote this letter. And the context was that the church was now going from being brand new and just called together, which was an exciting time. And they were actually in a transition period of trying to figure out what it meant to be a permanent, formal, established church. They were dreaming their dreams, I guess, and wondering how. Uh, they were establishing some of the formal structures that inevitably have to come when we are, you know, gathering together as a group. And they were trying to identify the practices that mattered to them. But would you believe it? People had different ideas. <laughs> Crazy. And even crazier, people hung to their different ideas or held on to their different ideas with great passion. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Some things don't change, hey? And unfortunately, what actually happened in Galatia as they were in this transition period from baby church to established church, uh, factions emerged. Okay, and the factions were over four areas. We'll get to the passage in a minute. I was going to say the first one was an issue of theology. They were, all four of these are really issues of theology, but I'll nonetheless call this one an issue of theology. So the, some of the Galatian Christians were really keen to bring the law of Moses back front and centre as a sign that people actually had genuine faith. Okay? And, of course, that was a fairly major theological issue to a church established on um, the grounds that Jesus Christ alone... <laughs> is enough to be right with God. So that was a pretty major theological issue. Then there were issues over race. There was a very clear divide between the, the Christians who were Jews and the Christians who were Gentiles. And sadly, un unfortunately, particularly the Jewish people were being quite insistent that their cultural traditions were things that were mandated in what it means to belong to this church at Galatia. You must be circumcised. You must this, that, and the other. And then there was gender. 
male and female divides and people determined what you or I or others could do according to their gender and there's of course the age-old one of power. There were a few strong personalities and people who had economic and social power, not necessarily a bad thing in itself, but they were using that power to gain undue influence in order to get more airtime for the things that they wanted to see were part of the ongoing church as it got established in terms of its rules and regulations about how they would be a church together. So factionalism was raging at Galatia as they were in this transition period. It's not actually surprising when you realise they were human beings <laughs> at the church in Galatia. Transition times can be such dangerous times for communities, particularly, I want to say, relationally. Particularly re relationally. You see, when the old way of being is under assessment and a new way is being constructed, when change seems like the only thing that is staying the same, <laughs> that's very unnerving, isn't it? When what is familiar is lost and the unknown loom la looms large, when dreamers get carried away and end up with a pile of illusions, and when realists keep asking how, 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 to the point that everybody's spirit is crushed and nobody can move, nobody can do anything, that's when we so easily stop looking through the lens of possibility. And what happens in human communities is that we turn in on each other. Probably not what we set out to do, but we turn in on each other. That was what was happening at Galatia. Now, I want to say that there, it's not that there wasn't a place in the Galatian church or any church, including this church, for debate and uh, discussions and reasoning. There's all, there always ought to be a place for those things in our church families. Place to debate and reason and discuss. There always ought to be space for that. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that we all have to agree on everything and not have those sort of discussions. But just as emphatically, there ought never to be a place in a church family, first of all, to fall out with each other and part company over minor issues. Gosh, that must make the devil laugh. <laughs> it just takes away our, our purpose and our focus and our the power and the influence that comes with us being together. So there's no place for that. And there's certainly no place to out and out fight with each other. Reason, debate, discuss, yes. <laughs> fight, provoke, argue, no. No place for that. Now, I know this happens sometimes, of course. The Galatians weren't the only ones. But I want to say this morning that if we live in the land of possibility as God sees it, then I think we are much more likely to be able to keep the big picture in our head and in our hearts, much more likely to rise up, to be able to look at what is best for others rather than getting overly exercised about, you know, what often, you know, in effect, I can see that even in the things I get uptight about, often other small things that actually don't really matter in the scheme of things. And certainly not to get aggressive and argumentative, even over the bigger things. Sometimes we need to debate and discuss and reason uh, firmly over some of the bigger things they had to over that law or Jesus but even as we look at those bigger things the things that actually really do matter discuss reason debate not fight argue provoke no anger now I know that LBC isn't the ancient church of Galatia but she is a community in transition and not just because a long-term pastor is leaving. That's, even if that wasn't happening, we would be a church in transition because we're trying to figure out what it means to be a vibrant and sustainable faith community in a post-Christian and hopefully soon a post-pandemic world. Not yet, I know, but hopefully soon. What does it mean for LBC, the church across the world, to be a church that our grandchildren and nieces and nephews and children want to come to, want to belong to. There's a lot of change to be navigated. There just is, isn't there? It's okay. <laughs> it's the way life goes. But there is a lot of change. Sometimes it's good just to say it out loud. Now, in the 16 years that I have pastored at LBC, I have seen uh, debates and reasoning and discussions, good, healthy stuff. 
And I've seen it on the board that, uh, that I'm on, um, particularly the board you know, over the years, certainly seen that. It's in the situation that we're in at the moment with the board with so much to be looked at. It's one of the things that I really appreciate about the board, good and healthy conversations. I have seen some disagreements over things that boil down to people's different perspectives, particularly on things like preaching and worship styles. I've seen some of that. And I have seen some, not a lot, but some parting of company over things that need not have divided us. Not a lot of that, but some. But I haven't seen many fights. <laughs> At least not in the 16 years that I have been here. And that is a beautiful thing about this church family. That's a good thing about this church family. It's a great strength of this church family. And I think if Paul were writing to you, <laughs> I think he would commend you for that and earnestly encourage you to continue to debate and reason and discuss, but not to part company over minor things and especially not now in this season of change. You need each other. Our community needs you to be together and love each other. Let's keep our gaze higher and wider and stick together as God's people in this place, not letting small things pull us apart. Definitely not to do that. But I think he would also commend us never ever to fight. Not even over, or recommend to us never, never to fight. Not even over the bigger issues, which you will face as we think about what a post-Christian, post-pandemic church looks like. There'll be big things to face. The job, the role I'm going into is to, in part, to lead that discussion at a state level, a denominational level. It's huge. There'll be big things that matter and you'll need to reason and debate and discuss, but don't fight. Don't argue. I think Paul would ask you to walk into this next season determined to look through the lens of possibility in God's eyes. I think he would say, dream your dreams, check in on reality, but do it in such a way that you're spending most of your time in the land of possibility according to what God sees. It's actually a scary land to live in, to be honest. <laughs> John's nodding up the back. <laughs> it's a scary land to live in. But I want to say to you, that way lies tomorrow. Living in the land of possibility with our radical God, that way lies tomorrow. Now, I know the details of the context are different, but if Paul were writing to LBC today, I imagine he might say something similar to what he told the Galatians. He might well have written to you, to us, on the eve of great change, these words. For you have been called, LBC, <laughs> to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Somebody's Bible's reading it to them. <laughs> Different version to mine, maybe. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. And then I'm not going to read these verses, but if you're following in your Bible, you'll see that then Paul offers one of his lists that are characteristic of what life is like when you don't live it looking through the lens of possibility. Okay, so he gives one of those lists. And then he goes on to say, but the Holy Spirit, God's own Spirit, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Listen to this list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And Paul's little twist of humour there, there's no law against these things. <laughs> we tend to look at that list and make it... A Perhaps that's a New Year's resolution. This year I'm going to be more loving, more patient, as if um, these are sort of things that are held up there that we need to aspire to. What Paul is actually saying is if you live in connection with the Holy Spirit, you will be like this. There's a different way of looking at it. 
This is what life is like in the land of possibility. It's a life of freedom that finds expression in those sorts of things. We'll know we're living in that land uh, of possibility. We know that we're living freedom when largely our relationships are characterised by those things. Because in Jesus, as Paul tells us in verses 13 to 15, we are free to love, free to love. Now, this is not a freedom um, from physical constraints. You know, the, the idea of this freedom is, is not that our bodies or anything physical is tainted and bad. That is not a biblical notion, and it gets taught a lot in churches. That's from Plato. You're not... Paul isn't dismissing the physical world and physical bodies as if they're bad things we just have to put up with and one day we'll be free from them. That's not the freedom that he's talking about here at all. The freedom that Paul describes is freedom to live in this world and the situations we find ourselves in, inside God's will. Freedom to live inside God's will and according to the guiding influence of his Holy Spirit. That's the freedom that he's talking about. It's the freedom to choose to love each other with every word and deed as the Holy Spirit prompts us to. The Holy Spirit, not the law, not a code of ethics, but the Holy Spirit who is alive and active in us. Now, of course, what the Holy Spirit will tell us to do in relationship to each other may well be in a law, <laughs> may well be in a good code of ethics. I'm not sort of trying to argue that. But the point is the Holy Spirit has to be the source, has to be the authority, the reference, not the law, not a code of conduct. The Holy Spirit has to be the reference for, the, the, for, for our moral and relational interactions. So freedom in God's eyes is just another word, which reminds me of a song. Isn't there a song? Anyway, never mind. Freedom in God's eyes is just for nothing left to lose. Yeah, thank you. I knew there was a song. So freedom in God's eyes is actually kind of works kind of well. Is living inside God's will. You got that bit? Loving each other like crazy because of followers of Jesus. Here's the crux. We don't have to count the cost of living apart from God anymore. Freedom is that we don't have to count the cost of living apart from God anymore. We don't have to count the cost of living apart from God anymore. That phrase, some of the wording out of that phrase I got from Scott McKnight, I love it. We don't have to count the cost, you and I, of living apart from God anymore. And that makes us free to live in God's will, to love each other like crazy, according to how the Holy Spirit prompts us to be with each other. And I guess that is what we are definitely forgetting. Anytime we insist that a religious or cultural law or a tradition or a preference or something external like a person's gender or age or race or wealth are qualities that, um, that either qualify or disqualify them from serving God in certain ways. That's when we get into that verse 15 stuff of being in danger of biting and devouring each other. And it's not just those sorts of things. That's also what we are forgetting, this freedom of not having to count the cost of living apart from God anymore, it means that, you know, you look at the Bible, there's at least four ways you can define hell according to the Bible, make good biblical arguments. If we took time to stop and talk here, we'd probably have some different perspectives. And that's okay. There's some things that we can't have different perspectives on, who Jesus is and what he has done. But there's a pile of stuff that we sometimes hold to so dearly and it's good to reason and debate and, and look at the Bible and decide what it is we think we believe. But you can, on so many things, actually support a number of different approaches. Let's not fall out over those sorts of things. Let's not fall out over whether creation literally happened in seven days or not. That's kind of putting our horizon down in ways that I think, yeah, don't do Jesus a service. Okay, so did you get that bit about freedom? Freedom is living in God's will, guided by the Holy Spirit, loving each other generously because we don't have to count the cost of living apart from God. I feel like when I really get that last bit, <laughs> it changes the way I go into my week, into my discussions. 
because I don't have to count the cost of living without God, I'm free to love you by giving you the benefit of the doubt when I hear something that I think, huh. Because I don't count the cost of living without God anymore, I can hold my worship preference lightly. I can accept and support the way you are made to serve God. I can allow for differences in theological perspective as long as we are agreed Jesus first and foremost. And I can be prepared to say, not what I want church to be. I've got ideas and preferences, I can tell you. <laughs> but not what I want church to be, but what our kids and grandkids and our neighbours' kids and grandkids need church to be. Freedom is living in God's will, guided by the Holy Spirit, loving each other generously because we don't have to count the cost of living apart from God anymore. Jesus has seen to that. Paul writes earlier in this beautiful letter to the Galatians in 2.20, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he goes on to say in Galatians 6, these fantastic words, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Especially here, my friends. Especially here. And while the love that Jesus liberates us to is not the only sign that the Spirit is active in us, I want to say to you that to Paul it's the most important. And that's got to tell us something, I think. <laughs> the love we are freed to matters, says Paul, because it summarises the demand of God's law. Love your neighbour. Love God and love your neighbour. Love the love that we are freed to matters because it endures forever, that famous verse, when faith and hope have gone, there will still be love. And it matters because it unites all the best characteristics of living a good life. Colossians, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And the thing is, all of this flows from God's love, which is... Um, empowered in us by God's own spirit. If you follow Jesus, God's own spirit is with you. Elsewhere in another letter, Paul wrote, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. We know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Uh, for most of my time at this church, I've had a quote on the wall in my office, or it's migrated to the outside of the filing cabinet at one stage, from a famous theologian called, uh, oh, lost his name, Frederick Bruce. I get confused because it sounds like he's got two first names. He was a person who saw what was possible in God's eyes. He's not alive anymore. The story behind the quote, which I'll read you in a minute. Maybe don't put it up there just yet, thanks. Oh, sorry, that's the other verse. Good, sorry, my, my mistake. The story behind the quote goes um, like this. Um, someone, it was actually Scott McKnight, who's a, a current, a contemporary theologian of great influence. He went to visit Frederick Bruce and he asked him what, whether he thought women should be ordained. So this is back in the 90s, right, when it was a, a big thing going on there. Bruce answered... This is the quote I've had on the wall. He said, I don't care much for ordination. <laughs> don't you love it? <laughs> but what I can say with regard to the exercise of women's ministry in the church is this. I am for whatever brings freedom in the church. I am for whatever brings the freedom of the spirit in the church of God. Frederick Bruce's answer was very much like Paul very much like the Galatians and very, very biblical. Whatever brings freedom of the spirit in the church of God. See, in Jesus we are no longer have to count the cost of a life separated from God. We are free. 
And with the power and guidance of God's own spirit, we can figure out how to love each other generously. I think that's an awesome relief. I think that's an incredible privilege. It's an incredible joy. It's really hit me again in this last few weeks. Free, do you get that? Free to love each other generously. Free to let go of some things I sometimes white knuckle hold to. (laughs) Because loving you, you loving me, us loving each other, actually matters more than some of the things we hold tightly to. Free to dream together of what God sees for the church universal and what he sees for this local church. Free to ask together, how can we step towards what God sees so that this local church will be a healthy and vibrant community that our children and their children and the children of our neighbours want to come to? I'm pretty sure you don't need to be a genius to say that it's going to be different (laughs) to what it is now. It's certainly going to be different to what it was then. And it might be a difference that we can't even begin to imagine at this stage. I don't know. It might not be. I guess that's the point. We don't know. But what will remain, whatever else might change, is love. Is the freedom to love empowered by God's own Holy Spirit who is with you in your conversations afterwards. Holy Spirit, how best shall I respond in this place? He'll talk to you. He'll be with you in that space. After all, to quote my dad, perhaps one last time as pastor in this place, God is love and everything else is surely a theological footnote. That does not mean that nothing else matters and it does not mean that anything goes. The Holy Spirit will make that very clear to us. But I want to say to you, let's not be afraid to let the pendulum swing out more than we might feel comfortable with in the direction of love. Oftentimes we need an exaggerated swing of the pendulum, don't we? to act as a corrective, in this case, reminding us we are first and foremost people freed by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit to love as he has loved us. Everything else comes in after that fact. Everything else. Laws and rules and preferences, everything else comes in after that fact. God sees great possibilities for his church to be a community that people long to live in. So dream your dreams, LBC, as you go into this next uh, chapter. And ask your how-to questions. You've got a good mixture of dreamers and realists here. Dream your dreams. Ask your how-to questions. Live and love in the land of possibility where you don't have to count the cost of living apart from God anymore. It's not for me to say, but perhaps LBC, you might consider adopting a verse for this transition period. Maybe these walls are words from Galatians 5.1. So Christ has truly set you free. Now make sure, LBC, that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. It's not for me to decree that a transition verse. I'll leave that to yourselves and your acting lead pastor, Josh Thomas. But one question I do want to leave with you all is this one. Leave with myself, leave with us all. To whom, which people, and in which situations is the Holy Spirit prompting you to act in love today, this week, and in this season? Holy Spirit, will you give us names and circumstances? To whom and in what situation that you can see ahead of you in the transition are you aware by the prompting of the Spirit that you need to act in love? And what are you going to do about that? I have experienced this church as a place of great love. Don't stop. Don't stop. 
I'm going to invite the band back to the platform and ask that you consider that question and ask God's Holy Spirit, who needs you to act in love towards them? And what circumstance that you can see on the horizon might you need to act in love in that moment, in that time?